All right, welcome to People Progressing. Um, this is another example of one of our ex-students at Thunder Ridge High School um, who is just doing some great things in the world and has served our country and is serving people every day. And I just want to introduce you to Ryan Huber and kind of let Ryan take us through his story of, it's an amazing story of what he's done and, and following his purpose and his perspective and passion. So. Ryan, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us where you're from and, and all that stuff. Okay, yeah. Well, um, I'm Ryan Huber, obviously, and uh, right now I live in uh, Stevensville, Montana, but I'm from Colorado. Um, grew up in Highlands Ranch uh, and went to school in at Thunder Ridge. Uh, graduated in 2006 um, and then joined the Marine Corps right out of high school and just kind of found my way from there. So. Um, yeah. And what did you do? What were some extracurricular activities and stuff that you did at Thunder Ridge High School? Uh, so I started off playing hockey. Um, I think right as I went to school there, they got a hockey program, which was pretty awesome. Pretty lucky, too. So I got to play all four years of high school hockey. Um, it was a club sport at the time, but uh, it was still a blast. And so we had the rink over there at the rec center, the indoor um, it was roller hockey. So we had the indoor roller hockey rink and basically you could just go play for hours <laughs> on end there. So that was pretty awesome. And then I also worked at the, I worked, so I worked at the batting cage over, uh, in the park near the stadium there for a while. And then I finished, uh, I finished off working at uh, played against sports for probably two and a half years going into the Marine Corps. So. And then when you, what, what did you decide that you wanted to join the Marine Corps after high school? Um, I just felt like I, I was already signed up to go to college and had my dorm and all that stuff picked out. Um, and then, you know, I never had a forethought about doing it. Uh, they just called one night and my stepmom transferred the call down to my room. And you know what, I think I was just in the right mindset to be like, well, this sounds really awesome, you know, uh, so um, it sounded exciting. And I, I guess I was just really ready for a kind of a big adventure. <laughs> and uh, so they were kind of offering that. And so two days later, I drove down to the office in Parker and signed up and then shoot right as we graduated, I shipped off to boot camp. So it just I, I really didn't even think about it. I kind of just kind of just kind of did it. So. And take me, take me through your mindset a little bit about uh, that first night that you went into boot camp and they drive you up and you get out of the bus and you're now in the Marine Corps and it's now real. What was your mindset at that point? I've always been interested to hear what people's mindset yeah. was in that point. I, let's see, I showed up, um, airplane ride over you know it's kind of it's a little bit of nervous anxiety you're not not really sure what to expect I mean they kind of had videos and stuff back then but like I mean we didn't have smartphones at the time so you're kind of you you hear what you get from people and uh, the recruiters and stuff like that and so it's kind of you know nervous energy and then um you know we show up at the airplane terminal the gate there and it like literally starts from there like you kind of you go straight to your 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 area where where they gather you up and then i mean it was <laughs> kind of immediate chaos and so you know you're you're driving on the bus over there and they're there's they're telling you to keep your head down and then you, you're just waiting for it to happen and you know that they're just going to come onto this bus and just start screaming at you so i was at that point i think i was pretty terrified because i just was you know completely unsure <laughs> of how this is all going to go down and so you know we get there and they start yelling at you to get off the bus and so I was you know at that point it was real and then they're reading the the uniform code of military justice out for you so now you got this whole other rules that you have to follow and all this stuff and so there began the the pretty long night um I guess we didn't it was the night that ran into the next day so it never really ended but as far as my mindset, it was just, I think I was in shock, <laughs> shock and um, kind of like, what have I done to myself here? Like, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> so it was pretty crazy. 
Yeah. So what, what, what propelled you to get through it? You know, what propelled you, you know, I've, I've always been intrigued by like you guys, like you guys who, who make it through that. And then, uh, well, the hell that what's the, what is it called in the Marines? The hell, is it hell week or is it, um, uh, yeah, it's kind of like a hell week. I think they call it, um, the crucible. Yeah. The crucible, the crucible week. So it's kind of like the culmination of all your training, which they've since changed the schedule a little bit since I, I went through the crucible my second month at the end of the second month, but now I think they do it at the end of the third month and then they become Marines. Cause we go back to the training depot for another month for kind of just learning all that kind of stuff. But um, I guess, you know, what kind of propelled me through it was just, uh, I mean, you just got to just take it step by step, you know, like it's, if, you know, you got your grand training plan, but at that point it was just like, I can't even think about tomorrow. I've got to worry about <laughs> making it to the next meal, you know, just like, and that's, so I guess I just took it and broke it down. Um, you know, and I remember I get one phone call to my dad, um, right as you get there to let him know that you're there. And so I think it was just like, okay, well now this is real. I have to do this for myself and I have to do this for my family, you know, like, I don't want to uh, disgrace my family or whatever. And then it just kind of becomes about, you know, making it through. And then, you know, you build these relationships there and you just like, you don't want to be the one, you know, you don't want to be the guy that doesn't make it, that doesn't fall out, you know, that, that uh, makes it through. And so they, they kind of constantly threaten you with, um, well, you're going to get dropped back and you have to be here longer. And you're just like, ah, you don't want that to happen because you know it's it's not a, a fun environment i would say to be living in for months on end so it's just kind of like well let's just get through this as quickly as possible just do what you're told and keep your nose to the grindstone and and uh you know it, it came quicker than i thought it would so and then w w take us through after you graduate and now you're a marine yeah. what were some of the things that you how long were you in for uh, so my contract was six years total. So I did a reserve contract because I still wanted to go to school. Um, and so after I graduated, I had about a week home. And then I had to ship back out for artillery training and uh, like combat training. So like they train you to kind of be a basic infantryman. So I spent about another three and a half months in training and before I got back home, before I could actually go to school up in CSU. So, um, so once I got up there, yeah, I just kind of, <laughs> uh, it was kind of a culture shock for sure. Being among, like having all the freedom, um, you know, so I think school was definitely difficult for the first couple semesters to kind of just wrap my head around just cause it was, I think it was too much freedom <laughs> at that and point. So did you do any deployments? I didn't. So when I first got to my unit in like January, um, they were just getting back from Iraq. And so not only was I the new guy, I was the new guy that hadn't deployed with the unit. So it was kind of like, you know, I had a couple guys that were in onboarding with me that, you know, ha were in the same position. So we were able to kind of grow together as that, but they immediately put me in this line um, to the, like, Hey, okay, you guys are going to Iraq. So you're the next one slated. So here I am in like February of 2007, already started classes at CSU and they're telling me I'm going to deploy in the next couple months. And I'm like, well, this, this is just blowing everything up. Like this isn't kind of how I planned it all. And, and then like two months later they said, Oh, okay, well actually you're not going to deploy. So you know, we're going to deploy you in November. So at that point I was really confused as to how to manage my class load, how I wanted to, if I was even going to re-sign up for CSU because it was just like, well, I'm just going to get deployed. So it doesn't matter. Um, so I think, um, I think I ended up doing it anyways because of the flakiness of the situation. So I, but it was like late in the game. So I got all these really early morning classes that I didn't want, <laughs> or, you know, just those kind of yeah. classes that, that weren't really geared toward my major. So, um, 
and yeah, that, then I just kept going with it because they kept saying that I was going to get deployed and then never actually happened. So I think it happened like three or four times where they're like, okay, you're going this time. And then, oh, no. <laughs> so it was kind of an on and off game for my entire college career, which is a little frustrating, but, you know, it's part of the game. So. And you got your degree from CSU, right? I did, yeah. 2000, I graduated in 2010, so I was able to finish it in like three and a half semesters, which was pretty awesome. So. While, be, while being in the Marines. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what was your degree in? I uh, started off in political science and then quickly realized that I had no interest in that. And so um, at the time, right as I joined, I wanted to become a Marine Corps officer. I think that was the ultimate goal was like, okay, well, I'm going to do the officer program. And um, so I got enrolled in that. And then I kind of switched gears and started doing like a sociology degree with like a criminal justice background because that's just kind of the path that most Marines take is because it's they kind of line up together a little bit. Um, and then I had a history minor as well just because I was super interested in, in US history, world history, war history, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, I think like two years into it, um, I kind of decided that I didn't want to do the Marine Corps officer program anymore. I kind of wanted to have control of my own life. Uh, and I think a girl kind of had a decision on, or a little weight on that decision as well at the time. So there was a lot of factors that went into that. Um, and then I kind of went from there. So I dropped out of that program, but I finished my enlistment through, um, through the unit I was already in. So. And then tell us, take us a little bit after um, CSU. Is that when you got into the fire, fire, firefighting? Yeah. So um, immediately after, after I graduated, uh, I tried to find a job. So this was 2000, 2011. Now I moved back to Denver and um, job market was pretty harsh. I didn't have the best GPA. I was, I was kind of trying to, work off the model that I had, you know, I worked full time in college too. So I had a full time job and the Marine Corps and a full semester's load. So I really couldn't focus much on my studies. So I just, <laughs> I just had to get through it. And so I think that hindered me at first was the GPA. Um, so I took a job as a security guard at a hospital in Denver, which was quite crazy in itself. But um, I found a job at a sales office down in uh, Denver and I started working there for, I worked there for a couple of years. I really didn't want to work there. Uh, it just was like, it felt like this was professional. I need to be a professional, you know, all this kind of stuff. And after about two and a half years there, I kind of was just like, um, I think I was like 25, 26 at this point. I was like, this can't be my life. You know, this isn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to sell things. I, this just isn't what I want to do, you know? And so I think it was like 2013, Colorado had a really big fire year uh, with the Black Forest Fire in Colorado Springs. And I think there was one up in Fort Collins too. And, um, you know, I just decided, I think things had kind of started to fall apart with my relationship and uh, home life and my job life. Nothing was coming together. And so that kind of all came to a head. And then um, I moved back in with my parents. So I was living in my parents' basement in Roxboro and commuting all the way to downtown Denver to go to work every day. And my buddy from the Marines called. Um, and he was, we were just talking. And he was saying, hey, I just got, I think he was having similar issues as I was, just um, relationship and jobs and all that stuff. And so... Uh, he's like, hey, I just got enrolled in this veterans program uh, through Southwest Conservation Corps in Durango. And it's basically going to train you to be a firefighter. Um, and they're going to like, you're, you know, you'll do some forest work for them and they'll pay for all your uh, initial courses. And I was like, this sounds awesome. Like, I have got to get into this, you know, like. I think my justification for it was like, I was, a, they were about to promote me at this sales job. Like the day that I gave them my resignation letter, they were literally offering me like a company car and like a salaried position. And I was like, no, I'm sorry. Like, I just, I felt like I'd put too much energy and um, 
I guess, uh, passion into fitness and being fit. And so like, I just felt that I was supposed to be out there. I was like, I should be out there helping these guys. Like this is, you know, this is what I should be doing. Um, I think I also had a little bit of guilt from not deploying in the Marine Corps, you know, just kind of like signed up to do a job for six years, never went to do it, you know? And so it was kind of a, well, this would be a good alternative alternative and it can take me pretty much anywhere in the U S. So, um, so yeah, I signed up then and there, as we were talking on the phone, sent an application into, into their place. And a week later they called me back and, uh, by May, I think I was shipping out to Durango to go do this program. So it's kind of how I got into fire. Yeah. And and you notice that the pattern here is you're always your, your purpose to, for you to be happy is to serve others. Yeah. So yeah. I, I had this similar thing with, with my business world experience. I just didn't feel like I was helping anybody. I didn't feel yeah. like I was serving anybody. And it's, just, it's so funny because they offered me a promotion and a raise too. And I actually turned my company car back in and so forth and went back to school yeah. to get into teaching. Okay. Teaching yeah. Education. It's almost the exact same story. And it's, we're chasing our purpose of serving others. And that's what, exactly what you had to do yeah. um, because purpose equals passion and passion equals purpose. And your passion is helping people. Yeah. So once you got into that, the firefighting, tell us a little bit about that. I know it was really hard on you physically yeah. and mentally. So my first, uh, when I first got there, I was just, um, you know, I was just a, a guy on a crew, you know, working my way up. So it was a veterans crew. And so I was with a bunch of other veterans and, uh, you know, they, they got us all certified. So we went to all these classes that a bunch of, seemed like kind of like a, oh, maybe like a military version of like Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts at first, you know, we're doing these camping trips and all this stuff, but you're doing it with like military veterans. So, you know, they're kind of grizzled fellas that are, you know, have, and a lot of these guys have deployed. So, you know, they're, um, I don't know, I kind of, I had a respect for them in that aspect. So, so we start doing this program and our crew um, definitely had some issues to start out with. Um, you know, I think there's a couple guys that were doing uh, drugs and drinking on the crew. And so they ended up getting fired. Well, so I ended up getting promoted to the crew lead of this little crew that I had just joined. And so like I went from being their peer to now their leader. And so uh, that was my first kind of like leadership role was um outside of the marine corps i guess um was to be on this the, to lead these guys in this fire crew so i got a real taste of all that stuff and it was kind of came as a shock there so after that i went to i almost gave up on the firefighting thing i kind of went back to cholera or back to denver for a little bit back in my parents basement i got a job working testing fire equipment in in the hospitals around Denver. And then um and then it kind of came to the realization. I was like, man, it, it kind of hit me again. It's like, man, this isn't, you know, you're 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 not really doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it's like I just did all that training for for nothing if I just let it go by the wayside. So um so I started signing up for um fire crews and uh, at that point, I really wanted to get a, as far away from Denver as possible. I was like, I want to get, I want to be in it way far away. I want to learn and just experience a whole different culture. And so I started putting in my application. I think I chose like Washington, California, a couple in Idaho, Montana. Um, I was like, okay, we'll see where, you know, we'll see where we go. So I just shotgunned it out everywhere. Um, and being a veteran and a crew lead, I was, I guess, a pretty highly sought after candidate. And so I, started getting offers all over the place. Um, and it was, it kind of came to me as like a shock because my inbox was filling up with all these offers. And I think the first one that I got um, was McCall, Idaho. Um, and I'd never heard of M McCall, Idaho. And more or less, I mean, I almost forgot Idaho was a state really. It's kind of like, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of up there. And so I joined this crew and, um, lucky for me, they had a, one of the most gorgeous ice hockey rinks that I've ever played in, like in this little community. And it's like, they have ice all year round and they barely, like it gets used in the wintertime, but the summertime, it just kind of sits there and people, you know, so I got to play hockey and uh, go 
go fight fire in McCall, Idaho. And it's, it's where I met my fiance. She's a former firefighter as well. And just the environment was awesome. Like it was everything I was looking for. It was just like, I mean, I was living in my car for a little while. Um, you know, I drove my whole life up there in this forerunner. I bought a forerunner right before I left so I could just kind of live in it if I needed to. So I just went on this like grand adventure and, um, you know, living in truck stop parking lots for a while and then bar parking lots, wherever I could just get a place. And I remember the first day I showed up, I didn't know anybody and I, I didn't have, I wasn't going to be able to move into the barracks for a couple days. So I just, you know, I, the first day I pulled in, I went into the brewery I was like, I'm just so scared and nervous like right now. So like, cause it was like nighttime in the middle of this town. And so I was like, I had had a few drinks, just went to go take pass out for a little bit. Cause I was just so nervous to start and be in this new town and just not know what to do. Um, and I was, back to your Marine days. Yeah. Yeah. Except it was all on me this time. Like there was no overarching body watching me. It was like, yeah. okay, this is all on you, you know? And so, um, you know, I had a, I budgeted a little bit of money to do all this, but it was a pretty limited amount. And so I was kind of like, all right, well, let's see where it takes this. And so I don't think I got paid until like three or four weeks into our first fire season. And so I think I took my fiance girlfriend at the time on our first date to like the brewery. And I was like negative $250 on my credit card. And I was like, well, chips and a beer this is all I can afford so you know five and a half years later here we are so um but yeah it was a great crew everybody seemed to be coming from a lot of it was a everybody was kind of around the same age I think I was 26 27 at this point I think like everybody else on the crew besides the leaders were about the same age kind of coming from similar backgrounds um for the most part and then it just it was awesome from there. Like we went, we spent trips out in the wilderness, you know, we did all this cool stuff and just, you know, fire to me, it just seemed like home, you know, I think it just, it clicked for me right away. Um, and so I spent two seasons in McCall and then I got a little antsy. And so that's kind of, I was kind of on like a, it was a fire module. So it was like a 10 person fire module. Um, and I wanted to kind of take it to the next level. I also wanted to earn a little bit more money. So like the next step up was like, I don't know if you guys have heard about hotshot crews. Yeah, sure. um, and so I was really nervous to do that uh, because I knew what it entailed. I knew that it was going to be like constant fire all summer long. So you basically show up in April, late April, and you don't leave until October sometimes so like first couple of weeks in October so so I was really super nervous about that but I knew that I could you know get myself in shape to do it and so I kind of put myself I think by this point to back up a little bit um, I ended up moving up and living with my girlfriend who was going to school at the U University of Idaho in Moscow um, and so I was living there working at uh, Northwest River Supply, which is based out of Moscow for some reason. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I did in the off season, but I also got my EMT um, while I was working up there. So just cause it was gonna help with my fire career and I just helped me more, make me more marketable, I guess. Um, and maybe even work, work onto like a department crew. Um, and make a little more money, get a better schedule. So, but that never actually really uh, happened. So, bump forward, I go to the Hotshot crew. Um, I got picked up by Lewis and Clark Hotshots, which is in Great Falls, Montana. And, um, you know, for, I knew that Hotshot crews don't really, uh, don't really have, they don't stay in location very long. They kind of, they're out on fires every two weeks. So two weeks home, or two weeks away, two days home, two weeks away, two weeks home. So it just kind of was that schedule. Um, so I didn't rent a place in Great Falls. I just outfitted my forerunner so I could live in it for the entire summer, which was awesome, but definitely, <laughs> definitely a shock to the system at first. Cause you know, you're living in this 
this uh, town, that, another, another situation where you're living in this town again for um, just kind of brand new area, not, not knowing where it was. And Great Falls isn't the nicest town, I would say. <laughs> it's kind of out in the middle of Montana. And uh, so, so yeah, I did that and we ended up, I ended up living in the car for an, a month and a half before we went on our first fire, which I did not expect. I figured we'd be right out the door, but after our first fire, Montana just blew up. And so we stayed busy and I think I did 980 hours of overtime alone in four and a half months. And so it was just hopping, just busy, busy, busy. And uh, definitely a shock to the system. It was, uh, it was a lot. <laughs> So it's just kind of working through that. And then, um, and then they picked me up the second year. I picked up my, my permanent position on their crew the second year. And that was a senior firefighter position. And so at this point I was three or four years in, this would be my fourth year in fire now. Uh, and I was going to be on the lead saw team. So I was kind of like, there's three saw teams usually on a hotshot crew. And those are kind of the, you know, you carry the most gear that you guys are like the, I guess the, um, the first guys to start, you know, doing line because you got to clear all that stuff first before the dig crew can come through. So I was now on the lead saw team going on a hotshot crew for the second year. And um, so I did that. And we, I think we did 1100 hours the second season. Um, so right after our, for our two weeks of initial training, we went right out the door. And so we were in Minnesota, we were in uh, Washington, Montana, Idaho, and I think we went to Colorado and Utah for a stint that summer. So it was kind of crazy, just, you know, busy, busy. Um, and the mental and physical effects, I think, started to kind of kick in a little bit for me then. So, um, yeah, Well, I don't think people realize the mental aspect of, of that. The physical part is just yeah. incredible. Yeah, the, the mental f effect that it has on you is is what I think that's what people overlook is how hard it is on you or yeah. on the firefighters doing these fires. And that kind of led you to the next chapter and, and through this whole process of of where you're at now, you're always pursuing your passion. You're always pursuing a purpose that's greater than yourself. And that's what I love about your story. Yeah. And you're also never afraid um, to take a risk. You know, you could have very easily stayed in that job. Um, right. And I, I tell people all the time, 70% of Americans are disengaged at work. Yeah. A lot of those people are, are they're afraid to get out of it. They're afraid to take a risk and, and move on to something else. And um, you're certainly, you know, somebody that is, is, pursuing your passion all the time and if you're not helping others or serving others it drives you nuts and um that's what i love about your story so that firefighting took you to where you're at now um which again is serving a higher purpose than yourself and why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now yeah so um i guess to kind of conclude on that um uh after the two hotshot seasons, I went to a helicopter crew my last year, and that's in the Bitterroot Valley, here where I live now. And uh, it was like a giant change of pace, which was good because it was, you know, it was a little bit better work-life balance. But then I got super bored with it <laughs> because it's just, it's it wasn't as constant as, it, like, you weren't always on fire. You're doing a lot more, you know, just mundane forestry work. And so... That led me to, um, I had an opportunity to go build uh, Alpine roller coasters, which I thought was just super awesome. And I was like, this is, this is awesome. I mean, back up just a little bit. My first off season after that is when I started coaching hockey. And the reason I started coaching hockey um, was because my first, my first three off seasons that I had is it's basically like being retired. You know, you, you, you get done with all this. You have this giant chunk of money. You got to go relearn how to live a normal life with your significant other, which <laughs> is a chore in itself because, you know, you haven't seen each other for three and a half months. And so now it's kind of like you have to relearn how to integrate your lives. But then, you know, you have all this free time. And, um, 
at the same time, you know, you're trying to like balance, how do I, how do I live like this? You know, how, you don't really want to go get a job because it's going to be for a short period of time. Um, but I don't really want, I, I don't want to take unemployment because I felt wrong about it. I did, I did take it for a couple winters just because like, especially after the hot shot seasons, I was so burned out. I didn't, I just, I, I, I needed to earn some sort of money. So I didn't feel great about it, but, um, I did it anyways. And, um, so I, when I moved to the Bitterroot Valley, I found this opportunity to go coach youth hockey in Missoula and they were looking for travel coaches. It, they touted it as a volunteer gig. So I was like, well, I mean, I've got enough money. I don't really need the money, but it'd be something to like keep me busy uh, during the off seasons. And so, um, so I started coaching and I didn't know, I mean, I've played hockey pretty much my whole, since middle school. Um, and so I know how to play, but like learning how to coach and coach kids was just a totally different experience, I guess. Um, so I, I was picked to be the assistant coach on the Bantam B team, which is like 13, 14 year olds. Um, and so they're the B team. So they're the, the team that didn't make a essentially. So, and the coach, the head coach I was with was, um, he's from California. He was a pretty hard, hard, hard driver. Like he was, you know, pretty stern about everything, you know, uh, real rigid. And so, but he, he knew his, his stuff. So like, he was like a student of the game. Like he, he studied all this stuff. I just think like, so I really got to learn how he managed the game and how he taught. So I, I really kind of just, I started managing like the conditioning side of it my first um, season because he's like, how are you with dry land stuff? And I was like, well, I mean, I used to run workout programs and, you know, work out for a living. So like how hard could it be to implement it to kids and doing all this stuff? So, so I ran a lot of the dry, dry land practices, which was usually we'd come in an hour before the actual skate. And then I would set up some sort of program for the kids to do, um, tried not to push them too hard because, you know, like 13, 14 year olds, you're not sure. So, I mean, training in a large group like that, you're not sure what kind of physicality you're going to get from certain people. And so I think it was a good, it was a good learning process for me on how to like deal with kids. Cause I mean, you get, once you lay out the workout for the day, I mean, then you start getting all these kids coming up with all these excuses, why they can't run, why they can't, you know, oh, I got knee problems. And so you start learning you know each one's little niche and you get to learn each each kid's personality a little bit which I thought was just it was awesome it was a challenge and um and then we traveled all over Montana we went to Canada Idaho um for hockey games and then we were just you know I think we practiced three or four times a week um and yeah so that's how I started getting into the coaching aspect and then, like I said, I went to, I had the opportunity to go build roller coasters for a little bit. Um, and I started doing that. I did that because um, I, I knew I wanted to get out of fire because I just started getting burned out. I, I felt like I wasn't serving the purpose that I was, you know, that I initially signed up for. It just seemed like I wanted to either do it full scale or not at all. You know, and I didn't want to do this halfway type stuff that, you know, I don't want to take credit away from the firefighters that do that. It's just, I felt like I could be doing more. Um, so when I went to start building roller coasters, they, I was able, they taught me how to weld. They taught me how to use like giant tools. And then I went out there and I started running crews on my first, my second day. <laughs> they had me running like these little crews out in California, how to, um, you know, I, I didn't know how to build a roller coaster. It was kind of like learn on the job. And then, you know, I, I don't know if, you work for construction companies, you get kind of people that like basically come and go and you're never sure who's going to show up to work. And so basically I was hired to be a crew lead for these guys. So whoever showed up, I would take these guys and then we'd go out and build the roller coaster for the day. Um, and you know, it was, it was, a, it was a challenge. It was, uh, it was fun. Um, but I think it, it just, a lot of the things that the people and, um, 
the mission just didn't hit a lot of things for me on like core values. And so, you know, like every day after work, like these guys would just go out drinking. Like I, I don't really, I mean, I'll have a beer here and there, but not every day after work. Like, it's just like, so I kind of just felt pretty uh, isolated there um, as well as like we were in California and this is right when the coronavirus hit. And so like we're locked down and like, that's really that there is to do is like you hang out with these dudes that just drink and drink and drink. And I was like, well, this isn't quite what I expected, you know, and, uh, and the schedule was a month on a week home month on. And I was just, I was tired of being gone for that long. And I think that's, I just was like, well, I want to be there for my family. I want to be there for, um, just, I, I would rather be serving some other sort of purpose. So so I told him I, was, I wasn't going to do that. And then I found a job immediately as we got home, uh, delivering sprinkler parts for the summer, which got me through uh, the summer, but it allowed me to stay home. So I, I think I started that in June and I finished that. I went through August just delivering stuff. So I was driving like eight hours a day all across the state, just delivering these parts. But um, I was also running dry land training for the kids um because like when we moved here it just felt like i didn't have a, a group or a family and these these kids and this hockey stuff it, like really like we became like a family like a hockey family and it was awesome and just like so like when it ended in april i was like man i want to stay connected to these kids like i want to help them out you know especially since they're on the b team they want to make the a team next year and it's like so i threw it out there i was like hey i'm gonna run like conditioning once or twice a week um as my schedule allows and so you know and I just threw that out there to all the parents and I think I had four at one point I think I had six kids one week that came out and so I just set up like workouts so I ended up buying a bunch of like just Walmart gym equipment and there's this there's this park down in Missoula that we just I'd have them meet me there after I got off work and we'd start running and then we would just, I'd set up workouts. And so it kind of fluctuated, but I usually had like a core of three to four kids throughout the most of the summer um, that showed up. And then for like the last month there, um, one kid, it was one kid that showed up. Um, and it kind of turned into like a one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, so like I really got to, which, I started to love because I think it was like maybe July I started to realize I was like, I need to do this for a living because I love this stuff. And so that's when I signed up to, for just the personal training certificate to just like, all right, let's get it. Let's start there. Let's start there. So I was working full time and then training this kid and then taking class, taking the class on or yeah, online. So I was, you know, I had a pretty jam packed schedule trying to fit all this stuff in. Um, and I realized that I just didn't have <laughs> the time to do as much as I wanted to. Um, and so another crazy twist happened is that the show, the TV show Yellowstone works is like in this Valley. And so they came in here to do some work or film the season four. And, you know, I was like, Oh, that'd be kind of cool. So I just kind of like sent them a picture and then like, like three days later they called me like hey do you want to be a part of the crew like you're gonna be you know basically standing in for these actors when they're when so like they'll they'll rehearse the part and then you go stand in where they were standing for lighting and all this stuff and I was like that sounds awesome like I'm gonna be working on a giant tv production like this will be sweet um and I got there and it was just like it was intense like you you know it's like you're meeting all these people like, you know, well, there's Kevin Costner. Like there's all these people you, you see, you know? And so, and then you're working with these people. And then, um, but then I realized is like, well, okay, this is, this is another job. You know, you kind of get to see how their world works, which is vastly different from anything I've ever experienced. But it also gave me the extra time to study and finish my, my uh, certificate. So like, in between when I needed to work, like you're not supposed to do anything because you're supposed to pay attention to what the actors are doing. But then like, you're not allowed to help out with anything because it's all union based and everybody's got their job and you just do your job. <laughs> so I ended up getting a lot of extra time on set to continue studying and uh, figuring out a way, figuring out my next steps 
for um, how I wanted to take this business to the next level. And then, um, yeah, so that's, I finished that out. We just finished that last week. I finished my training cert probably mid October. And then I've been applying for gyms um, just cause I wanted to get some experience. Um, and so, which now is a terrible time to be trying to apply for a gym because of <laughs> the coronavirus. So that happened. Uh, and so, you know, I had a couple interviews. I went out and kind of outreached to some of these local gyms in the area. And they're like, man, I, it's a tough time right now. And so then I was like, well, maybe I need to take this business online, you know, like somehow online. Um, and I had a fire buddy that recently just became like certified as a, like a life coach trying to help set this kind of stuff. So he kind of did some similar stuff. So I set up an appointment with him because I wanted to hold myself accountable to this. Like, you know, if I knew myself, I knew that I would like look at the process and be like, that's a lot to do. You know, maybe I'll just go back to fire or do something like that. Or just trying to, I had a, I didn't have the mindset I needed to really start my own business. And so I wanted to hire a coach and he's a friend too. So like, just to help keep me accountable and like make sure that I'm, have goals and that I'm reaching those goals and that I'm just keeping that positive mindset so that, you know, that I can actually complete this. And, uh, so we finished up with like a program last weekend that he had me on. And, um, you know, I've just, ever since then I started I, basically yesterday and I was like, I've been absent from social media because of the way I felt about it for years. Like I would maybe do like a, change my cover photo or whatever, you know, but I felt so strongly negative about Facebook in the last probably five years, just with all the political. And I just felt like I should be living in the moment, doing everything um, out in the real world. But, you know, I, so I, I really isolated myself that way. And then um, I think that really caused me a lot of issues mentally because, you know, everybody's on it. Everybody's doing everything on it. So, so yesterday I think, and this was part of our process was just kind of trying to break down my beliefs of it and that it can be used as a tool for good things if you really make it and you can block out that negative stuff, you know? And so yesterday was just eye opening for me because like, you know, it was, it was a big step for me to just like update things because I'd never hadn't done that in so long and then like to make that post i was just like okay well if we're gonna do it we're gonna do it full send and then i just couldn't believe the the response that i got you know i was just like oh wow you know like i was just expecting you know i wasn't expecting that at all but i was like i've been missing out on this for so long like i have this whole connection of people like that i had basically just never given a chance you know, and so I, I, I'm just overwhelmed by <laughs> the opportunity. Uh, so, yeah, well, and it's the same, again, our stories are really similar. I, I had nine friends on Facebook because some of the young teachers at school got me on there and, yeah. and they became my friends and I didn't really know what I was doing. And then I wrote my book and my chiropractor really liked my book and he wanted to do an interview with me on Facebook Live. Okay. And I'm like, I'm not even real sure what that is. So we, I went down and, and we did the, the interview and I go, what do I do now? And he goes, well, you know, a lot of people go out and just send friend, friend request. Long story yeah. short, by the end of the week, I went from nine friends to 1100 friends Oh my! <laughs> from all my students and yeah, you know, players and, and other people. And it was really kind of fun, like you said, and, and I had 1100 views of that first video. Oh yeah. And you know, my, my purpose is to try to help people enjoy life and to find their purpose and their perspective and passion and not be one of the seven out of 10 people that are disengaged in life in, in work and what they're doing and so forth. And when I read your story yesterday on Facebook, I'm like, this is exactly what I'm talking about because you're always running, you're always pursuing your purpose yeah. and you are always pr pursuing your passion that passion to help kids now is, is really, you know, it's, it's been a long journey. Yeah. And along the way, you've always, 
you've always served a purpose that's greater than yourself and helping others and working with your hands and being outside and doing those things. And um, what you're doing now and what you're going to be doing now for people to get them healthier and, you know, and not just healthier body, but healthier mind because of what you're doing is yeah. just phenomenal. And, and you've, you've paid the price is what we used to say in athletics. You paid the price to get to this point. And along the way, paying that price was some, a lot of hard work and a lot of hard days and so forth, but it was always because you wanted to serve a greater purpose and you were always pursuing your passion. My question to you is, what is your perspective? Because in between my purpose and, perspective and passion in my book is perspective. What's your perspective on life? What's your, what's your overall perspective? Man, I, I think it's, it's changed radically and I think it's really forming, especially now. Um, but basically that, you know, I don't want to live a life that isn't worth living. You know, I, I don't want to work a job. I don't want to spend any more time at a place that I just, I have no passion for, you know? So I, I, I really just, you know, I've, I've felt what it's like in these situations, you know, like these, where you, where you achieve something momentous as a team, you know, and it's, 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 I want to live for those moments, you know, and, um, you know, I think right now I'm trying not to let a lot of the things outside of the, of what I can control, control me. Cause I know that the world is really crazy right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's hard to kind of let that not seep in, but, um, you know, I think I've just tried to focus more on controlling what I can control. And, you know, I think I've always known that I should run my own company and I should, you know, I have the tools and abilities to do this. Um, so, you know, I think it's just, my perspective has really shifted lately to like, Hey, this is, you know, you can definitely do this. There are people, there are tools that are out there that can help you. And um, so I, I really have a lot of hope for the future. And I just, I want, I want this to work out. You know, I, I want, because honestly, I, every time I go and look for another job, I just, it's like, man, how long is that one going to last until I don't feel like it's doing what I need it to do anymore, you know? And so it's just like, I owe it to myself to make this work, um, to, you know, I owe it to my family to make this work, you know? So, and I feel like a lot of people could benefit from the experiences that I have, you know? And so I think it's been hard realizing that lately because, you know, you kind of just view yourself as this, it's like, Oh, I'm just another guy trying to get through the grind, you know? And that's, you know, I think realizing that, Hey, you might have something to offer has been pretty wide opening, wide eye opening for me. So. Well, and that's the thing I want you to understand is, is to, that realization and that perspective of I have something to give this world because of what I've been through yeah, is what's going to fuel you. And what I want you to remember is this, always think of this. And I always thought this as a coach, this is my number one thing as a coach was I coach to see where my kids are five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years from, from, from when I coached them. Okay. What are they yeah. doing? So when you're looking at your business and you're working on a business that's helping people become better and you're 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 challenging people to go beyond what they thought they even they thought they could do because how many times in your life did you do that when you went to the marines okay you you did things in the marines that probably you didn't even think you could do so you went outside your comfort zone and you challenged yourself then you went into you know some different jobs that just weren't your passion that weren't your purpose you didn't have a purpose of serving people in those jobs so if, you know your passion wasn't there for them and then you went into firefighting and look at all the stuff that you did with the firefighting in terms of going beyond what you thought you could do there. You challenged yourself. You're constantly challenging yourself. Yeah. And I call it coaching, practicing, and challenging. So what I, what I, my, my advice is coach them up. You know, when you're, when you're doing your training and stuff, you're coaching them. You're coaching them how to do the lift. You're coaching them how to do the drill that you want them to do and so forth. Then I want you to practice them like crazy. Just practice and go, go over those drills and stuff over and over and over with them so they get better. And then after you've coached them and practiced them, 
you challenge them all the time, just like you challenged yourself all the time because they weigh the way that they grow to get better so that they can take on life's challenges like you have five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road is you challenge them every day on what you're teaching and coaching them, what you're coaching and and practicing them in. Now you challenge them in those things. I used to have a saying that I used to make practice hard. So games were easy. Yeah. We want to make what you're doing challenging and hard so that when your people get out in the real world, it's going to be a little bit easier. They're more prepared, more equipped to take on what life's challenges are going to be. And that's exactly, exactly what you've done. And that's exactly, exactly what you're going to do with your next venture. And that's why I'm so excited for you. When I, when, when I read your post last night, I'm like, man, this is awesome. Yeah. Because again, as a teacher, you know, like five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, look what you're doing from when you came out of Thunder Ridge and to what you're doing now and all you've been through yeah. and all the challenges you've gone through and all that. And now what are you going to do? You're going to pay that forward and you're helping others with those challenges and so forth. So I just commend you on it. Why don't you tell us what the name of your company is and the name of your business? So we can maybe get you some clients up there in Montana or maybe even some down here. You can do it online. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just started it. Uh, it's, I just used Huber Athletics because, you know, I think I wanted to uh, honor my family. You know, they're, I come from a long line of uh, very well accomplished Hubers. And so I think it's kind of like, well, why not make that the forefront of it, you know? Um, and yeah, so I think my biggest focus um, is, is I'd like to do athletic training, uh, like with the kids out here, I think I can really make a difference because there's just, uh, there's a, there's a great opportunity for it, but you know, also just coaching people with like, I have one friend, uh, a friend in Columbia right now that I'm working with, um, that I've, I've kind of been, I went to Columbia a couple years ago and we kind of collaborated down there. And, uh, so I kind of help him out with some stuff that he does. And so he's helping me out with, being my test client right now. So we're kind of going through the the process and like, so he's going to be focusing on weight loss. And so it's going to help me just get a better idea how, what I need to do for him. And so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm honestly excited to just, you know, um, get started with it and uh, see where this goes, because I think, you know, I think it has a real shot. So. No, it does because of who you are. Yeah. And it, and it does because your purpose is so great and that purpose will fuel your success in this. And do you have a, like a website or anything people can get on or is that? Uh, not yet. I'm still building that. Yeah. Still working on that. Um, kind of wanted to just kind of throw it out. I wanted to get the Facebook updated yesterday and then um, I'll probably be trying to get a website going here in the next week or two. Just, just kind of, figure out, I want to get the plan down. I want to fully understand the, um, maybe not fully under, but just get an idea of how the matrix is going to work and what platforms I'm going to be using. So, uh, we're real, I'm really in the infancy of this, but, um, I have a lot of support and I think, you know, I think it should be off and running as soon as I can get some of these things, things put in place. So you're ready to go, buddy. I'm, I'm so excited for you and I'll put this out there and hopefully more people will see it and, and uh, can get involved and maybe I'll build you some clientele and, and so forth. And I'll do anything I can to help you because I'm just so proud of you and, and what you've done. You've served our country um, in, in numerous ways. Um, you've showed people that you're, you know, you can get through uh, hell week in the Marines, the crucible and stuff, because you said it before your purpose was once you started thinking about your family and not letting your family down again, your purpose was greater than yourself. And that fueled you to get through that. Um, You've said it now, Um, your purpose is with the friend that you're helping now um, is weight loss. So you have a purpose that's greater than yourself and helping someone else out. And um, you're finding some joy in life because of it. And I I always have my, my purpose is this, when you're, when you're born, you have a peace of mind, you know, you come out, you're crying and everything else. And they put you in your mother's arms and everything's peaceful for you, man. You know, everything's going to go right and everything else. And my goal is for everyone when it's time for them to go hopefully after they're 90 100 110 years old that they die with that same kind of peace of mind that they did everything they could to help others and to serve others and make everyone else's life better 
And that's where you're on your way to. And, and you're finding a peace in your life right now because of the things that you're doing and you're doing the things that you enjoy. Yeah. And it's a great story, um, what you've come through and the adversities that you've overcome with all the stuff that you've done and the hard work that you've put in. And uh, that's going to fuel your success through this. And you're going to help other people find the same thing. So I'm really proud of you, Ryan. And um, I'll put this out there and hopefully um, we can get you some clients and, and so forth. And if you ever need anything, you, you know how to get a hold of me. And I'm yeah. here for you with anything that you need. I do some life coaching and stuff as well. Um, cool. So if there's anything that you need or anybody that you know that needs something, just let me know and, and I'll be there for you. So um, yeah. thanks for doing this. I think it's been yeah. awesome and um, you're an inspiration to a lot of people now. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate the time. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's a pleasure getting to reconnect with you and, you know, hopefully working together and some aspects going forward. So. All right, buddy. Awesome. Keep, keep killing it up there and keep grinding away. I know COVID's kind of slowed both of us down with what we're trying to do now, but yeah. it's not going to stop us. So no, just keep that not. mindset and keep that mindset of 10, 15, 20 years from now, what are those people that you're working with going to be? And that will, that will fuel you. So thanks a lot and have a great day, Ryan. And I'll, I'll get this out. Okay, buddy. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. You too. All right, have a good day. Yep. All right. Bye.